Like some superheroes, MIT hackers lead a double life. Like their colleagues in class, they go to lecture, study math, science, engineering, day in and day out. But they also lead another life, one on the rooftops, shafts, and tunnels of MIT's campus. Such is the life of a hacker. I'm one of the group of historians at the Hack Gallery website, and we take great pains over the years to collect lots of photographs, stories, and all other assorted items from the hacking community in an attempt to try and preserve this unique part of MIT culture. <laughs> the common public view of MIT hackers is that they just make things appear on the Great Dome, kind of like this. But in reality, there's a lot more to, than that. There's a lot of exploration involved. There's a lot of project planning. Tons of things that they just learn in class that they actually implement in a real-world scenario, like, like here. Um, and all of that comes together to show this, which is simply the tip of the iceberg. Exploration often is the key to a lot of these hacks and how they start. That's how many hackers kind of figure out how to get these, to these places, how to loft these giant objects. In this case, it's a repurposed tank parachute looking like the Earth. Um, and so with much practice, this is actually the end result of, of what you see from, from the hackers. Different than a lot of pranksters you might see at other tech universities, MIT hackers generally choose to remain anonymous or have only sign-ins kind of represent where they have explored. Um, the sign-ins are basically meant to be seen only by other hackers so that nobody actually no, you know, can, can see them at all unless you happen to find the place itself. And so there is an amount of uniqueness when Hackers find each other's sign-ins, possibly decades in the past, possibly before they were born, and sometimes possibly even before their parents were born. So just common areas around MIT end up having quite a bit of history attached to them. Contrary to the belief of some, and contrary to what other tech universities do, none of these activities are actually sanctioned officially by the Institute in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> you know, as such, uh, the MIT Hacking Code of Ethics is an important part of why MIT lets this continue to the extent that it does. That these are some you might consider basic rules, you know, use common sense, leave things the same or better as you found them, um, and, you know, don't hack alone. All of these help guide the, or, all of these are very important to the hacking community as a whole and help its continuation in, in MIT. Um, that said, MIT as an institution has a complicated relationship with hacking in general. There are many administrators in which they love to see these hacks on display for the world, showcasing MIT students' ingenuity, what they can do, um, but then there are others that are more concerned with the liability aspect. So it is yet another trade space that hackers must often navigate when deciding to do one thing or another uh, here at the Institute. <laughs> hacking has been somewhat, ha ha hacking has been sometimes joked to be called applied mechanical engineering in an urban environment. Because in essence, they are trying to deploy a giant mechanical object on top of a huge structure in the middle of night, all while you know, avoiding capture by the campus police. So none of this is an easy challenge by any means. Um, and from hearing a lot of these stories, you usually get to pick up signs of, you know, there's, there's a little bit of luck involved. There's probably a little bit more skill involved, but most of all, there's a lot of teamwork. Something of this magnitude could not be done without lots of teamwork. 
And so this is actually a real world culmination of what a lot of the students learn in class. You know, strength calculations, uh, modularity, cost, uh, how, how you can hold something up the side of a building, you know. Some of these things are hard to teach on paper, but are much more readily learned uh, in person actually doing it. Um, and so it provides a unique experience for these students to actually get to do these things. Case in point, with this particular hack, they actually had to design a special rig just to haul it up the side of the building. In fact, it was designed so well that even the facilities workers who were removing it had to figure out how to put it together and then lower it down the same way that the hackers had actually put it back up. <laughs> Another important skill hackers often learn <clears throat> is the ability for improvis improvisation and learning to quickly adapt to situations. So this was a giant model of the Wright Flyer, which was deployed on its 100th anniversary of the first flight. Now, when hackers went to, to build this, they got all their materials up to the top of the dome, were assembling it in the middle of the night, and then suddenly realized they were missing one of the most critical components of the plane. One of the main wing struts, you probably can see it in the back, I, you know, or the lack of, was missing. They lost it. It wasn't up there with them. Um, and so they had to scramble you know, in the middle of the night to try and figure out what could they do to replicate this structural beam and make this plane actually stay together on the roof. They managed to find a bunch of extra rope and webbing and tie a variety of tension members to simulate this, what used to be a rigid beam in the structure. So they redesigned it on the fly and it managed to stay up there for several days. Another instance where hackers had to improvise on the fly was in the fabled Caltech cannon heist. Now, if you walk up to the cannon, you can see at the end of the barrel, it is clearly labeled weight of 3,620 pounds. So when the hackers took this, they thought, no, oh, we know exactly how heavy it is and how to transport it. Problem was, that was just the weight of the barrel. It actually had two to three times more mass just because of the giant steel structure and the wheels attached to it. <laughs> As a result of this, the trailer that the hackers were using to transport the cannon, the axles almost broke off and it bent the back half of their pickup down to the ground. <laughs> so the original plan of taking the highway to where it was that they were going uh, quickly went out the door and they had to take standard streets going no faster than 20 miles an hour through downtown LA in rush hour. Now, luckily, LA's rush hour traffic helped them to this regard. <laughs> um, but they did ultimately make their destination, and as everybody knows, it showed up at MIT's campus shortly thereafter. Sometimes hacks aren't actually meant for a large audience. They're just more surreptitious. They're meant for whoever happens to actually notice them. Uh, like this one, you, you may not notice it immediately, what's wrong with this skyline, but there is, in fact, an active street light on the top of the Building One Pyramid. Some of these things kind of go unnoticed, except for those who just happen to look up on the, and see the skyline, which makes them all the more special. Another one that's kind of like this is the famous Harvard-Yale football game, hackers actually managed to change the, the Harvard logo. Um, <laughs> and it was one of those things where if you looked closely, you would kind of notice something was off, but then if you looked even closer, you'd be like, oh, that's what's going on, okay. Um, so it was kind of special in that regard. <laughs> Sometimes hacks are done just for the engineering challenge in itself. So this was done a little more than a decade ago, but it was a model of red line T car. What made it special is that it actually ran around the dome. <laughs> um, and so it would just, you know, you'd see it and it would just start going around the dome. And, you know, on the surface it's very simple, but it actually 
took, apparently, dozens and dozens of hackers months to actually make this. Um, another type of hack, which many of you probably have seen, some of you maybe even have interacted with, are the interactive kinds of hacks. <clears throat> One such example is the Boston-facing side of the Green Building. It's been privy to many playable games, such as Tetris or Super Mario or 2048. Some of them were harder than others, given the low pixel count. Uh, plus, any mistakes you made were instantly displayed to all of Boston. <laughs> um, And more recently, the interactive hack of 70 barber poles that were strewn around campus in commemoration of the age-old hack where a pair of students legitimately bought a barber pole somewhere in Boston and wandered around and were accosted by cops the whole time. Um, and so there was the challenge to find all 70 barber poles scattered around campus. Um, here are just a couple of them. but. Uh, And many people ask, why would MIT students, consumed with their coursework and labs and everything, sacrifice their precious sleep to go running around on rooftops all night doing things like this? Well, for many, it's for the adventure, it's for the camaraderie, and the sincere trust built amongst friends. These things are not done just for the world to ooh and ah at. They're done for the hackers themselves. These adventures can be a very powerful social motivator for good in student communities here at MIT. To be driven to do something that is labeled as that cannot be done. To be driven to put something in a place that other people would consider boring or mundane, to make it otherwise exciting. To make people wonder, how on earth did they do that? Thanks. <laughs>